Theodore back, Max. Today, we are going to be discussing two texts in Deuteronomy, uh, and I'm very excited to get to these texts. Um, let's talk a little bit about Deuteronomy and the ways in which it's it's a separate kind of source in the biblical pantheon and where we think it comes from. Yeah, this is great. Okay, so we've been talking a lot in this series about what's sometimes called source criticism or biblical criticism, right, which is trying to separate out some of the different strands of authorship that we see in the Torah, right? So a lot of scholars and a lot of Jews, although you know this is somewhat different from uh, more traditional or orthodox approaches, think that the Torah and the Bible is a composite, right, of uh, different sorts of sources, different sorts of time periods, and so the what's sometimes called the D source, the Deuteronomic source, is one of the somewhat later ones, although not the latest, right? And so the Book of Deuteronomy is you know sort of the the prime. Uh, 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 example of uh, Deuteronomic biblical writing, but a lot of what we see in the beginning of the prophet section of Tanakh, the Nevi'im section, especially some of the historical books, like for example, a lot of the book of Samuel also seem to have been uh, redacted in some way or put together by someone in a broadly Deuteronomic camp. And uh, the book of Deuteronomy or the Deuteronomist is often identified with the late seventh century, right? The late 600s. And a lot of the reason that people think that is because we are told that King Yoshiahu, King Josiah, found a book of the law, Torah, something like that, during temple renovations, and then that caused some religious reforms, and so a lot of people want to identify that book that was found with Deuteronomy, found. Yeah, and it, <laughs> that story always struck me as a little, like, <laughs> really... <laughs> You know, it's like, ooh, I found a new book of the Bible. I guess oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to everyone adopting my book uh, of the Bible, which is very, <laughs> which is very uh, skeptical of circumcision. So exactly. just stay tuned. Exactly. After we finish the podcast, you know, after we have several podcast seasons, we can really, uh, you know, set our sights higher. Oh, look, here's a new scroll. <laughs> it's, it always struck me as a little like, really? They bought that? But no, this, this is really important um, because as we... As we start to think about the um, the evolution of the way the Israelites and later the Jews conceived of God, um, the Josiah reforms that took place is like a really kind of pivotal moment in this transformation. What do I mean? So when you go back before the 8th century— <laughs> I'm always super uncomfortable because the 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 kind of level of evidence that we have for what we're talking about is very very poor, right? We have a you know a fragment of a kamea here or an inscription there or a a pot shard with some you know paleo Hebrew writing on it there and you're trying to like piece together. But I think like let's talk about some informed speculation, shall we call it, that Yahweh the God that um, we've been uh, referencing in multiple, in, in many of these uh, Chavruta sessions, um, was originally some kind of a storm God, a local deity that people worshipped. And there were different versions of Yahweh. And in one version, Yahweh has a consort, a female consort called Asherah. And at one point, uh, we actually have archaeological evidence that Yahweh and Asherah were in the temple in Jerusalem which is kind of crazy to think about. But the reason I'm bringing up this sort of ancient history is because for a very long time, um, the deities that we read about in the Bible were local deities, uh, just like the, the Ammonites had local deities and the Hittites had local deities and the Egyptians had local deities and the Phoenicians had local deities. The Hebrews and the Israelites had a local deity or local deities, right? In fact, the original word in the, in the first, the earliest layer of the Bible that we have access to, which is uh, in source criticism, it's called the E-text, the Elohist text. Why is it called the Elohist text? Because the word for God in that text is Elohim, and the word Elohim is, is plural in Hebrew, which is like a trace of a polytheistic past, maybe, maybe. The uh, Deuteronomic texts are really crucial in helping to cement 
this um, you know, monotheism and this sort of like vision of relationship with God also where there's sort of reward and punishment. And so very characteristic of Deuteronomy, for instance, and this will be relevant background to what we're going to study today, is this idea that God's going to bring the people into the land of Israel. And if they do the right sorts of things, they'll flourish in the land. And if they do the wrong sorts of things, then they're not going to flourish in the land. And this is different uh, from the sort of covenant or covenants that we saw in Genesis, and especially in Genesis 17. So after, uh, in our last episode, where covenant was kind of off the table because we were talking about some of this priestly worldview, here with the Deuteronomic text, covenant is really back on the table, but a different sort of covenant than what we've seen before. Absolutely. I'm just going to quibble with one point. I'm not going to call this monotheism yet. I'm going to say this is henotheism. Um, mm, and henotheism yeah. is, is, is different from monotheism in an important way. Henotheism is, is the belief that there are many gods, but we're worshiping one, right? It's not a denial of the existence of other gods, which is where I would draw the line for monotheism. It's, um, to quote one of the earliest passages in the Bible, Mi kamocha ba'elim Adonai, yeah. uh, who is like you among the gods, Oh, mm-hmm. Lord, that's yeah. not monotheism. Yeah. That's henotheism. And I think even so, so the, Deuter- the Deuteronomic text, the Deutero-Isaiah sort of uh, source in the Bible is moving away from a kind of situation in which, and we read about this in the book of Kings, where the Israelites are really interested in worshiping other gods. In particular, in the north, there's the god Baal, right? And we hear a lot about people worshiping Baal. And there's this sort of sense that they're very, um, almost like polyamorous with their relationships with these deities. And Josiah and the reformers who write the texts that we're going to read today are very much against that. They want to move away from this kind of polyamorous relationship with gods, and they want to have like a monogamous relationship with the one god um, that 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 they that they think is the only god that should be worshipped, right? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. Excellent. Should we jump in? Yeah, yeah. Let's jump in, and we're going to be reading from Deuteronomy ten, and we're going to be starting uh, on verse twelve. Yeah, and. Uh- The English translation that we're going to be using today is Robert Alter's, and this is a a really great translation. The beloved Alter translation. This has quickly become uh, perhaps the most highly regarded biblical translation. He completed translating the entire Tanakh several years ago, although his uh, translation of the Torah has been out for uh, a few decades now. So, uh, you know... Much to say about translations that we won't say for now. But as always, Max, we reserve the right to quibble with a word oh, here yes. or there. Always, always, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Deuteronomy ten twelve. Ve'ata Yisrael, ma Adonai Elohecha shoel me'imach, ki im liyira et Hashem Elokecha, la'lechet bechol drachav u'lahava oto v'lavod et Hashem Elokecha bechol levavcha u'bechol nafshecha. And now Israel. What does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to worship the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your being? To keep the Lord's commands and his statutes that I charge you today for your own good. Look, the Lord your gods are the heavens and the heavens beyond the heavens, the earth and all that's in it. Only your fathers did the Lord desire to love them, and he chose their seed after them, chose you from all the peoples as on this day. And you shall circumcise the foreskin of your heart, nor shall you show a stiff neck 
anymore. Ki Adonai Eloichem hu Elohei HaElohim v'Adonai HaAdonim ha'el ha'gadol ha'gibor v'anora asher lo yisa fanim v'lo yikach shochad. For the Lord your God, he is the God of gods and the master of masters, the great and mighty and fearsome God who shows no favor and takes no bribe. Ose mishpat yatom v'almana v'ohev ger latet lo lechem v'simla. Doing justice for orphan and widow and loving the sojourner to give him bread and cloak. And just to note, last time we met, we translated ger as immigrant, and I think I still think I prefer that for Gare, immigrant. I, I, I like Leanne Feldman's translation of Gare. Yeah, so Sojourner is maybe a slightly more traditional translation and I think still the, the right ballpark, right? But because it, it really emphasizes this idea of like living with you. The Ahavtem et Ager ki gerim heitem be'eretz mitzrayim. And you shall love the sojourner, for sojourners you were in the land of Egypt. Et Adonai Elohecha tira oto tavo duvo tidbak uvishmo tishavea. The Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall worship, and to him you shall cleave, and in his name you shall swear. Hu tihalatcha vehu Elohecha asher asaitcha et agdola veet hanoraot ha'ele asher ra'u enecha. He is your praise, and he is your God, who did with you these great and fearsome things that your eyes have seen. B'shiv'im nefesh yardu avotecha mitzrayma ve'ata Samcha Adonai Elohecha kechochvei ha'shamayim larov. With 70 persons did your fathers go down to Egypt, and now the Lord your God has set you like the stars of the heavens for multitude. All right, so that's our text. Uh, that's our first text for today. And of course, uh, verse 16 is the one that we're going to be honing in on here. Umaltem et arlat levavchem, and you will circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. Yeah, and there's and there's a question about how these words are being used, actually, right? Like, how literal is this, right? So obviously it's metaphorical, right? But some people want to translate these uh, terms the same way that they would be for circumcision of the penis, right? Circumcise the foreskin, that's what altar does. Um, I think that makes sense. Uh, JPS, right, you know, a sort of standard translation has cut away the thickening of your heart. Right. Uh, But there is something that seems really visceral about this. Right. And certainly invoking circumcision. Mm -hmm. And in the context of this passage, we also have a lot of invocations of the sort of historical ancestry of the people. Right. We have mentions of, um, you know, Avraham and his family. Uh, We have mentions of Egypt, etc. And I think it's worth noting also that, that we do have another text that uses foreskin of the heart as a metaphor that we haven't read yet, that's back in uh, in Leviticus, in a priestly text. But there I think it's even more clear that it's being used in a very metaphorical sense. Um, and, and the foreskin in that text is being used as a sort of, in many translations, they don't even translate it as foreskin. They, like the JPS here, they would say something like... Um, thickening or and and the reason is yeah. and and it's an interesting translation question right because the literal translation here is and you will circumcise the foreskin of your hearts um and and you're saying alter does have it that way yeah yeah alter does translate it that way yeah more literally yeah mm-hmm. um yeah. and the question is is it a metaphor or is it not a metaphor right is is wh- yeah. what's going on here the christians will of course Yes. pick up on this language later yeah. and and run with it um because in christianity of course circumcision is de-emphasized uh, maybe that's 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 an understatement <laughs> circumcision is is denigrated as a, a thing that's no longer necessary and so the move that the christians will be making is from physical circumcision to metaphorical circumcision and so this metaphor here um, that, that, like I said, can also be found in Leviticus, but that is prominent in Deuteronomy and will become even more prominent in the prophets. This is very uh, useful um, rhetorically for for the for Christian theology, right? Yeah, right. And, and this text puts the same question on the table that will be relevant for the Christians, right? Which is, what is the relationship between metaphorical circumcision and literal circumcision, right? The thought here seems to be that you have both and that they're connected, right? But are there times when they'll conflict? 
Are there times when you should prioritize one of the other? These are are really important questions that don't really come up in the same way before this text in the Torah. And um, that will come up in a lot of the prophets as well. And, you know, in thinking about what exactly relationship with God looks like, especially when this passage starts with this idea of walking in God's ways, which can also be sort of more legal or um, sort of moral or spiritual, and loving God, right, which is certainly not legal, but also fearing God, which in later rabbinic tradition tends to be um, associated with halakha as well as with a sort of attitude. So there's like a lot of mixing of different forms of relationship in this passage and indeed throughout Deuteronomy. I think it's worth pausing to note that we don't get circumcision in the Deuteronomic canon yeah, no, except that's right. in this form. Yeah, yeah. Right? Only so, metaphorical it, circumcision in Deuteronomy. That's right. Which I think is is significant. Mm-hmm. Because there's a lot of repetition of laws, yeah, of mitzvot, of commandments in Deuteronomy. Yeah. yeah exactly. So so that's that's kind of interesting, relevant. Um, and the Christians aside for a second, if we're just thinking about the pantheon of uh, biblical sources— This source seems to be very cool on physical circumcision compared to the other sources. Do you think that would be a fair thing to say? Yeah, no, I do think that's right. And one of my favorite biblical passages is um, Isaiah 58. This is sort of an aside, but but it'll be connected. And what Isaiah is doing in that passage, which we uh, read uh, as the Haftarah, as the prophetic reading on Yom Kippur, is he's saying that, look, you think that you're fasting and you're doing such a good thing, but you're oppressing your workers and you're sort of like trampling on the sorts of things that God wants you to do, even though you're participating in this law, right? And he starts there, but then he sort of ends up uh, with a more legal perspective of like, yeah, okay, like, yeah, you should keep the laws, but you should do it with the right sort of attitude, or you should do it while also being a moral person and keeping other sorts of um, relationship with God, other sorts of moral commands. And this passage is not doing something right that like that, right? It's not raising the spirit of circumcision as a way of then emphasizing the law, which you could easily imagine someone doing not saying this source necessarily, but like that would be a a move that would make a lot of sense. Start with the sort of spiritual dimension of circumcision, circle back around to the the legal one. And and as noted, that's not what we see here. Right. And it's a, it's an intentional choice and it's not one that, uh, that I think we should take lightly. I think the the, the Deuteronomist is just cool on circumcision, right? Like if we think about the sources as, as they've been identified, just as a quick uh, summary, the E source has literally nothing to say about, like the earliest layer of the Bible has literally nothing to say about circumcision. The J source we saw has something to say about it uh, in Genesis 34 in a very interesting way of it being a, a kind of like ethnic marker almost. So we mm-hmm. do have that in the J source. The P yep. source, of course, is where infant circumcision is introduced and where it becomes super important and key to the the kind of covenantal view of Israelites and and the the ritual we went through that last time uh the manner in which it fits into the priestly worldview but here in D in the Deuteronomist all we get are metaphors about the foreskin of the heart and circumcising the foreskin of the heart so it's it's notable yeah yeah it's quite notable and um you know in general we have the idea of sort of God's faithfulness in this passage, and but also the sort of language of relationship, right? We have love. Um, we have, you know, sort of worshiping God with all your heart and with all your soul or your being or your life, depending on how you want to translate nafshecha. And um, so circumcision of the heart really seems to fit into this sort of paradigm, Right. Of um, of this sort of relationship language, right? Because we have circumcised the forcing of your heart, nor um, have a stiff neck, right? Nor sort of be resistant. So it's you know there's this sort of implicit aspect here of the or else, but the main focus is the um, the sort of positive relationship with God. The other thing that I wanted to point out here 
that you get in this text in a very rich way is um, what I would call the kind of progressive wing of you know early Israelites, where we're we're all of a sudden we're seeing concern for um, for the other, for the yeah, the most yeah. downtrodden in society, and I just want to bring that up because yeah you know in our day and age. Um, the Jewish religion is often co-opted by people who are very reactionary right-wing politics. And yeah. Um, yeah. those of us who have more progressive politics, such as myself, and I believe uh, I'm yes. not uh, overstepping by <laughs> saying that you fall into this category yes, too, Mac. That's right. <laughs> um, they, they'll they often sort of pretend like there are no progressive impulses in the religious tradition. And the Deuteronomist uh, has something to say about that. Uh, is is what I'm yeah. getting at. Here. Yeah, and this concern for the other is embedded in this sort of language of and presentation of relationship with God, right? And that's really important because uh, in some other passages about, for example, God's justice, we have stuff about punishing being evidence of that, right? So for example, in Exodus, in the sort of 13 attributes, which we uh, recite on uh, the high holidays and on other holidays as well, um, there's this idea of, you know, part of how you show that God is just is showing that God doesn't leave any crime unpunished, even if it's sort of multiple generations. And the rabbis will explain that away in various kinds of ways. But the, the point being that here, in this Deuteronomic text, the um, the way of showing God's justice and greatness is helping the other and also um, helping the Israelites. And so we have this strong relationship as well between God's uh, uh, favors to the Israelites and um, the way that God is helping people even outside this group. All right, Max, let's do the next text, which yeah, will be the go. last text that we cover in the five books, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. And again, just for a little bit of background, the whole book of Deuteronomy is told from the perspective of Moses on the cusp of the Israelites entering the land. So he has learned that he's not actually going to be able to go in. And these are like his last words to the Israelites as they enter the, the promised land. That's that's the conceit of the book. Right. And this passage is from uh, quite close to the end of the book, shortly before the closing poem, which is not exactly the end of the book, but sort of is almost a coda to what's come before. Um, so this is a little bit before that. And it shall be when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse that I have set before you, that your heart shall turn back among all the nations to which the Lord your God will make you to stray. And you shall turn back to the Lord your God and heed his voice as all that I charge you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your being. And the Lord your God shall turn back your former state and have mercy upon you, and he shall turn back and gather you in from all the peoples to which the Lord your God has scattered you. Should your strayed one be at the edge of the heavens, from there shall the Lord your God gather you in, and from there shall he take you. And the Lord your God shall bring you to the land that your fathers took hold of, and you shall take hold of it. And he shall do well with you and make you more multitudinous than your fathers. And the Lord your God shall circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your being for your life's sake. All right. Again, God will circumcise 
your hearts and the hearts of your children. So we don't have the the foreskin reference here, but it's obviously the same concept. It's the idea that there's a metaphorical foreskin above the heart, which means that there's something that's keeping that's that's um it's a sort of it's a block between your heart and God that needs to be cut away, right? Yeah. You know, and one thing that really strikes me about this passage is that unlike the last passage that we looked at, in this one, we're starting from a place of transgression, of violating relationship with God in some way, right? In the previous passage, it's only implicit. But in this passage, we have this idea of if things went wrong, don't worry, they can go right again. And not only is circumcision of the heart representing that, but there's actually this idea that God's circumcising the heart of the Israelites rather than the Israelites doing it themselves, which is really interesting, right? So um, so not only is there this sort of relationship with God, but God has a sort of role in helping to repair this relationship. I, I want to take a step back, actually, and talk a little bit more about what kind of a relationship is being envisioned here versus what kind of relationship is being envisioned in our other sources. Okay. Okay. That, yeah. I think something that has always struck me as absurd about the Deuteronomist is the second paragraph of the Shema. And you shall love the Lord, your God with all of your being. Right. Well, the first paragraph, right, right. Right. The second part of the first paragraph. What is that? What what kind of like what kind of a relationship requires you to be commanded to love the person you're in a relationship with? That so so I want to start there. Because that <sighs> yeah. seems to be core to what the Deuteronomist expects from the Israelites in the way they worship God. And that to me is an innovation. I'm not seeing that in the other sources, right? Certainly in like the earliest layer of the Bible, God is very aloof, right? In the E texts, God is barely communicating with, with human beings. In the J text, when God communicates with human beings, it's it's obvious it's 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 frequently in anger. Uh, yeah. Or it's transactional yeah. on some level. And the, the sort of stiff neck language is reminiscent of that, of of anger and of yeah, of the people yeah, doing stuff that God's uh, unhappy in with. The in the Christy texts, it's all about managing, like the the sort of yeah. divine, yeah. and and that's yeah. what the obsessive focus is on. Like we talked about it being alchemical, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's almost like you see some sort of proto mystical roots there too, mm-hmm. where it's mm-hmm. like. Th- there are forces that we're trying to manage here. Yeah. But yeah. this is different. The Deuteronomist is asking us to have a relationship where we are infatuated with God, where we where God where the love of God fills up our entire being. And that's yeah, a commandment. Yeah. It's right, right. ahavta, you shall love. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So to, to, I, I want to start there because to me, that's like that's the big kind of elephant in the room. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. And I think a lot of the question is then, you know, what sorts of actions are following from love, right? And are sort of actions or attitudes more important or something like that? In a lot of the sources that come previously in the text of the Torah that we have it now, you know, Genesis, Exodus, there is this emphasis on God doing stuff, right? Um, you know, choosing the people, Abraham, and then, you know, later the Israelites taking them out of Egypt. And we get that here, but it seems to be coming from something else. It's a different explanation of kind of what's most important about relationship with God, about sort of how to think about God. And yeah, I'm sorry, this is a little, uh, this is a little kind of speculative or sketchy, but I think it's actually really difficult questions to even get at in the biblical text here, which are maybe not thought about enough, but which really bear on this question of how to understand metaphorical circumcision. And uh, I mean, the thing, like the history here doesn't help us, right? Like clearly this text is coming out of a desire to sort of reform like there's a lot yeah. of anti-corruption kind of rhetoric here. Right, right. There's a lot yeah. of loving the stranger and the other kind of rhetoric here, which, you know, again, progressive yeah. Jews, we should embrace this fully. 
But like that doesn't help me with the theological question that we're asking here. None no. of that sort of explains this sort of peculiar idea that we are expected to be infatuated with God. Yeah. That it's, it's an expectation. I, I would say like almost a covenantal expectation that it's part of the deal here is that we're supposed to be yeah. in love with God. Yeah, yeah. And then, right, and circumcising one's heart is what allows one to do that, maybe symbolizes that, right? So we might think that just as circumcision of the foreskin is a sign of um, being in a sort of relationship that you can't get out of in, you know, in, in sort of older as well as rabbinic thought, uh, maybe circumcision of the heart as well is a sign that you can't get out of this sort of love and, and the relationship based on love. All right, Max, we've come to the end of the five books of Moses uh, in terms of the, the circumcision uh, themed texts. And what I want you to do, you've been avoiding this the whole time. I want your opinion on the historical order in which these texts came into the Jewish tradition. Um, and yeah. I'll give you mine afterwards. I want to hear why Good. also. Yeah, yeah. So I think I have lower credence in this than you do, right? I'm less confident. But, you know, I think we have Exodus 4 being the sort of oldest layer, and then Genesis 17, and then some of the priestly sources in Leviticus they were talking about, and then this sort of Deuteronomic source here. And, you know, why is that? Well, in Exodus 4, we have this sort of folk story feeling. We have some weird language, some some strange ways of using language, which doesn't necessarily mean it's older, but sort of that would make sense. And we talked about, about some of those issues in that episode. And then in, um, in the priestly text and in the Deuteronomic one here, we have, you know, sort of different ways of imagining and understanding relationship with God, which is sort of easy to think about being worked out in a sort of competing conceptions of relationship with God. And we talked about this a bit in the uh, the priestly source Leviticus episode as well, you know, this question of like, was there a sort of progression of attitudes uh, among the Israelites, or were there a bunch of competing ones at the same time? And I'm quite sympathetic to thinking that there were competing ones, especially maybe in the 7th century BC. Um, and so not clear exactly when the Genesis 17 text comes in, but it does seem foundational in a way that then other sources are sort of like modifying and maybe referencing in certain kinds of ways, but they're sort of doing their own thing and figuring out what relationship with God means uh, for themselves. So that's kind of where I'm at. But Ellie, where are you at with the historical order of these texts? So for me, like the first thing I think to state is that the earliest layer of the Bible, the e-text, has no mention of circumcision whatsoever. Um, I think that's interesting and important. Um, I think Genesis 34, uh, for me is probably the earliest circumcision text that we have. Um, and that would be the J source, uh, that we covered in that video. Um, well, <laughs> well, I left out 34. It's really hard to say. I left it out in part because I don't know how to really fit it in. I think you have an easier schema. <laughs> well, actually, uh, let me, let me step back a second. Okay. I think there's a very good case to be made that Exodus 4 is the earliest circumcision text that we have, but I only believe that if Yigal Ben Nun's adjustment is accepted. Oh, so which I, I, as the viewer might recall, we, did not accept. Right. And I, I'm, I'm half persuaded by this because of the grammatical problems that we talked about that we covered in that text I think that if you make that adjustment, the whole text makes sense. That one word. If mm -hmm. he's right, mm -hmm. that that, is, that was the original word, that you make that one word adjustment and the whole passage actually makes sense, I think that's the earliest circumcision text that we have because what you have then is a story of Moses, for whatever reason, didn't circumcise himself and then, you know, he's being attacked by Yahweh in the desert 
and his wife cuts off his foreskin to stop Yahweh from killing him. And that is very much like the sort of folk legend that you would hear in the ancient Near East that would have predated all of the texts. So if that's right, if she circumcised Moses and not their baby and not their son, then I then I accept that Exodus 4 is the oldest text. If, however, we don't accept that, and that ends up being an instance of infant circumcision, then I'm placing that text way later. Well, but then it's not I'm clear placing, that it's infant circumcision. As we noted there, we don't know what age the son is. It's That is true. But that in combination with the apotropaic nature of the act makes me think more of Book of Jubilees time. Because in the Book of Jubilees, it's very clear that they are deeply concerned that if they don't circumcise their son on the eighth day, that something terrible is going to happen to him. Yeah. So, so... Exodus 4 is still a mystery, even after all this discussion that we've had about it. Certainly. But that's that's how I would date that, depending on on whether or not um, uh, Yigal bin Nun's uh, adjustment is correct, either the earliest or very late. So that's that's Exodus 4 for me. But but generally speaking, I think Genesis 34 is the earliest, setting aside Exodus 4, which again, I like to bracket because... I've never met a Bible scholar who could actually give me any satisfactory answers about that text. Um, so I'm bracketing Exodus, Exodus 4. Genesis 34 is the first, and we have this, this concept of a kind of tribal marker being employed there, that, that sort of idea. I think after that has to be the priestly texts, um, starting probably with Leviticus and then moving to war. I, I think the people who wrote Le- the Levitical texts that we covered are the people who wrote Genesis 17. That's that's my sense. Yeah, I'm um, less convinced I, of that than you are, but it's an interesting take, yeah. Yeah, uh, I will admit that my confidence level in this is lower than <laughs> that Genesis 34 was earlier. Um, and then I think, yeah, I, I think I agree with you that the, De- the Deuteronomists are the latest, although I don't think they're much later than the priestly texts because no, if we're talking yeah. if we I, I still uh, again this is a big we talked about this, this there's a big debate about when to to place the the bulk of the priestly text historically yeah. i am with the bible scholars who believe that it's pre-exilic um mm-hmm. and if the priestly texts are pre-exilic then the proximity to um to we're talking about like, you know, a century or so within when the Deuteronomic text was written and when the priestly text was written, something like that. Yeah. Maybe even Um, less, significantly less. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, like I, I think what's worth emphasizing as we move out of the five books of Moses, um, and I, I, I mean, when we get to Joshua, I think we're still dealing with a priestly text. We can talk about that when we get to that text. But, um, but I think what's important is to sort of flag the different meanings i don't i actually have no confidence in answering the question of you know did these evolve one from the other or were they competing ideas that i have absolutely no idea how to answer it's a really good question but yeah. the themes that will be drawn upon in the future we're still in the prehistory of the jewish tradition we haven't even gotten to the 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 greek period or the second temple period or the <laughs> rabbis like we're we're in the like the the embryonic stages of the meanings of circumcision in the Jewish tradition. And I think this, like thinking about it, how we start with these different sources and how they all have slightly different takes, right? So the Genesis 34 source we have as a kind of ethnic marker. And yeah. Genesis 17 yeah. we have as covenantal and the introduction of infant circumcision. Um, Genesis, uh, Exodus 4 is apotropaic, like the, the power of circumcision to protect. And then, yeah. Yeah. and then, and then ultimately the Deuteronomist with the kind of metaphorical shift to the foreskin of the heart and circumcising the heart. Yeah. These strands are what everyone in the future are going to be pulling on to some degree or another. And I think that with this foundation, 
we're in good position to start encountering the rest of the Jewish tradition. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And so it'll be really interesting for us to continue to be attuned to these different meanings of circumcision in Jewish texts, but also for our viewers. You know, I definitely encourage you when you see circumcision mentioned in a Jewish text to think about, well, what does it mean here? And don't just assume that it means like, you know, kind of all of these different sorts of things together. It might end up doing so especially in rabbinic texts. But it's important to kind of ask that question and to not assume off the bat more than we get from context. Max, this has been a pleasure as always. Thank yeah, you for joining me. Yeah, it's been me. really great, Ellie. Thank you. 